Hi. Um, Hello. You've been uh, very outspoken and um, gotten uh, helped many people sort of deal with their own in inner issues and that sort of thing mm. um, by sort of dancing with your demons um, in public and talking about the um, <laughs> very, very meaningful and very potent um, moments in your life. Yeah. And, and what has been the biggest challenge in terms of connecting with your audience and, and going about that? Well, um, I, I, it's a really interesting question. And, and I, would, I would tell all the young men here that it's very unfortunate you fall into what is um, rather unpleasantly called a, a demographic, is that you belong to the demographic that is most likely to die from suicide. Not only that, suicide is the greatest cause of death in young men under 35 in this country. Greater than cancer, greater than heart disease, greater than um, car, in, car crashes, anything else, suicide. If you're going to die and you're under 35, the most likely reason is that you will take something to end your life. That's a really serious issue. And because behind it all, that's the it really is the best image you can think of, a tip of an iceberg, cliche as it may be. Underneath it all is the vast bulk of this hideous floating monster, which is all the things that aren't quite suicide, which take enormous care, enormous understanding, enormous coping from those who are friends, family and lovers of those miserable enough to be afflicted, as I am, with some form of mental disorder, in my case bipolar disorder, which is one of the more common ones that is on a spectrum. Um, supposedly, like many, many of these things, like of course autism is famously on a spectrum from Asperger's to severe autism, <coughs> supposedly, different ways of looking at it, but um, uh, bipolar has a bipolar 1, a bipolar 2, and cyclothymia, which I used to be diagnosed as having cyclothymia, but rather un unfortunately my psychiatrist, whom you'd be pleased to know I visited today, not just to top up on my madness before speaking to you, um, <laughs> But uh, I just happened to be off to America tomorrow um, and I wouldn't get a chance to speak to him until uh, the new year or something. So I thought I'd better have a, have a word, see how we're going. And he said to me, he said, well, I'm, uh, the, the bad news is, he said, um, that we're going to have to change your diagnosis. I said, oh, why is that? I've been having issues of late, uh, many, most of which are kind of quite happy ones, but are what you would call... M hypo was actually called uh, uh, hypoactivity, um, hypomania is the technical name for it, which is the opposite of depression, literally polar opposite in the case of the image, it's literal, if images can be literal. Um, and so that if the North Pole is hypomania, uh, extreme activity, uh, rapid speech, um, um, grandiose ideas, huge amounts of self-belief, none of which I would actually say I have, and the opposite is, is, is a total blank darkness, refusal to engage with the world, a sense of absolutely no future whatsoever. Um, but there is an equator which is equable and pleasant, as equators would be, but there's also something else which, where the, 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 the spherical image falls down, which is what's known as a mixed state, where you get the, the worst of both worlds. You get extreme mania but you also feel completely useless. I've been having quite a lot of that and so uh, the good news <laughs> according to my psychiatrist is a change of medication which is uh, always an exciting thing in the life of, of a loony. Um, something else to try out. Oh this one gives me constipation as well that's nice. <laughs> or or um, <laughs> uh, warning um, may, may cause excessive weight gain. Oh, yeah. And sweating. Have you noticed, incidentally? Um, so there are... And I, yes, I am open about it, but I'm open because I'm in a position to be so. I'm not in a position where I might lose my job tomorrow if I slightly overstate, or at least not overstate, but I state the absolute truth. And the message, if there is a message, and um, we're... Um, What's the name of the splendid local charity that we're here representing, in fact, Mike? Uh, mind Your Head. Mind Your Head, that's right, yeah. Not, I was just going to say Mind Out, but that's, that's particularly gay-minded, uh, gay loonies, which is a very specific <laughs> subgroup that I remain, remain uh, a member of, proudly Mind Out. But um, anyway, yes, Mind Your Head, which is a good title, I think, um, and other charities, I think one of the most important things, there, in fact, at the top of the list, is not the illness itself, but the public perception of the illness. In a sense, it's the illness the public has, 
what you might call stigma, a huge question of stigma. Um, and I was talking to some of the people on, uh, um, you know, on the committee and, uh, earlier on and saying, when I, was, um, when I was at school, the phrase did not exist, the concept didn't exist in our heads, and so far as I know, there wasn't a single example of someone exhibiting this behaviour, and that is self-harm. And I was shocked to discover uh, over the last 15, 20 years since I've been involved in mental health charities, just how pervasive and pandemic this thing is. And at first I thought, well, it's probably, I say well, it's not as I'm excusing it, I say it's, it must, there must be a, a reason, there must be a, because constantly one wants to attribute reasons to mental illnesses that you would never attribute to physical ones. You don't say, why has someone got lymphatic cancer? It's just preposterous. It's either a genetic disposition or it's just bad luck in some way. It's, you, know, um, you might say there are lifestyle illnesses <coughs> like diabetes and, and, and heart disease, but you certainly wouldn't say, how come he's got diabetes? He's really rich and famous. That would just be a ridiculous thing to say. Well, he's asthmatic with all that money. But <laughs> <laughs> it's just absurd. And that's the state we're so often in. They self-harm. So, so I had thought, well, self-harming people might be people who live in, in, in really unfortunate conditions in estates, um, what, you know, what used to be called that awful title, sink estates, um, with you know, mothers on drugs, fathers who left them before they were born, brothers who beat them up or abuse them, you know, all kinds of terrible life issues that you can imagine would make them turn to some screaming form of self-attention or indeed self-harm. And um, I was talking to, I have a string of godchildren, 13 of them, uh, uh, like and my little string of pearls, and the charming they all are, getting older and older, of course, as you are, as everybody is, we, you knew that. Um, and w one of them, she's, she's at uh, Beedales, a school in Hampshire, rather advanced, um, sort of liberal school, well known for the fact, you know, everyone you know, calls the you know, master's mistresses by their first name or probably even, you know, butt face, you know. <laughs> so it's, but it's quite, you know, it's quite expensive. So it's an expensive, progressive, liberal school. Um, and the children seem very well balanced, we call them children, the students, whatever you call them, seem very well balanced, very at ease, very charming. Any Bedelians Bedelian, in the house? No, you see, they've got better things to do. And, and um, um, I'm too embarrassed to say it, probably. So I, I, I talked about the fact, one of them said, what plans have you got for any future documentaries, maybe on mental health? And I said, well, I, you know, I don't want to keep making myself the subject of it. I, know, I, it, I don't want to be a professional bipolar person any more than I want to be a professionally gay, you know. Which brings us back to being a rent boy, actually, which I think I'd be <laughs> faintly disastrous. Uh, <laughs> tweed? <laughs> Is tweed your thing? Um, <laughs> it's unlikely. Um, but anyway, uh, I thought I'd make, I'd, I, I sort of su suggested this to the BBC, who seemed quite interested. In this programme called Shh, because, because it's a, a sort of hidden, unspoken about thing, and also it happens happily to be the initials, self-harm. Um, and I talked about this and said, you know, gave my opinion that maybe it was something to do with coming from an appalling background and, you know, it's a, something, it's all part of this misery that is uh, associated with poverty and, and deprivation and lack of education and so on. And in the, um, the selfie scrum, which I'm afraid isn't going to happen today, um, because I've got a plane to catch tomorrow morning and I, if I don't get to bed before midnight, I'll, I'm going to be up at four. It's, yeah, it's that bad. My plane leaves at six. But um, anyway, so I just thought I'd plant that seed in your minds in case you thought, oh, just one, go on, please. Because, um, but um, in the selfie scrum, at this school, about three people whispered in my ear, um, actually, seriously, um, if you want to do something about self-harm, this is the place to come. I know about ten friends who regularly self-harm. It's a verb. This is what astonished me. It's a verb. How can it be so pervasive as to have become a verb? And I found myself utterly puzzled. I thought I knew the, you know, the full tout the nuances de l'éventail social, as they say in, in French. You know, all the all the nuances, all the all the shades of the of, of the human spectrum of, in terms of good, bad, unhappiness, misery, and so on. But is, this was one I simply, well, I could understand in the sense that I could grasp the fundamentals of it, but I couldn't put myself in the position of imagining it 
I couldn't imagine myself putting a knife against my flesh. Flesh, as um, Wilfred Owen said uh, in, in the poem Futility, um, can limbs so dear achieved? And these are dear achieved. Put a hand on your leg, put a hand on your other hand. How dear achieved is that? How, what an achievement is that of nature over hundreds of thousands, millions of years, and indeed just your own lifetime? How dear achieved to take a knife to it. What, is, what are you asking for? And I really, really wanted, want still to make this program. Um, because the more people I speak to, the more they say, oh, God, yeah, I know. I mean, hundreds of people. School, oh, you're kidding. Oh, she did, she did, he did, he did, she did, she did, he did. I'm going, what the? Why isn't this better known? My parents have never heard of it. I said, I was, this is something I think I'm doing. Self-harm? What do you mean sort of being drunk and things? Well, <laughs> actually, that's quite smart. Because I can understand that form of pernicious chronic self-harm. Over time, you slowly poison yourself with drugs and alcohol, cigarettes and so on. It may be psychologically you are saying, I hate my body, I hate myself. Well, we all hate ourselves at some degree to some part. I think self-judgment, self-analysis, indeed quite sometimes negativity is quite a positive thing, if I can be so absurd. You know, in other words, you know, all the great artists, if you read their diaries, the number of times they attempted to tear up what they did. Very few of them were cocky. I mean, a lot of them were very, very self-confident in terms of what they knew what art was. They knew everything else was crap. You know, Turner, Van Gogh, all these kind of famous sort of signature children of the, the tormented artists. They knew how shit everybody else was, but they also questioned themselves constantly and very often viciously. And we know about Van Gogh's self-harm. He is the most famous example of it with the, the ear. Um, I used to tell this joke about having Van Gogh's ear for music, but it doesn't really work. Um, but uh, there are, I suppose, other examples of people doing that to themselves in earlier periods, but I'd love to, 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 to invest that. So anyway, it's an endless subject. I do go on, don't I? Come on, let's ask anybody else. 